their state councillors, their excellencies, their ambassadors, their representatives of the Partner Institute of the IMD World Competitiveness Center, their distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great honor and great pleasure to welcome you here to the World Competitiveness Center 30th anniversary. Today, this center, this institution, is a world reference. But 30 years ago, 30 years ago, when Professor Stefan Garelli, I don't know where he is, I saw him before, thought about it, it was a, it was a vision. It was a pioneer initiative. And here we are today with this worldwide recognized institution. So it really is an honor for me to be here today and to be your master of ceremony. Um, 30 years ago, it was a vision. So we're going to try to see what happened these 30 last years all together during these two days. We'll be celebrating, of course, but we'll also be working. What happened since 30 years ago? Where are we up to now? What, it is, what does it mean to be competitive today? And what would it be for the next 30 years? Now we've entered this data-driven society. What will AI bring? So many questions with the digital transformation we're going to handle with today and tomorrow. So it will be celebrating, but it will be also a lot of working. My name is Fatih Derder. I am member of the Swiss Parliament since eight years. And I am also a journalist. I was a former editor-in-chief in the Swiss NPR and former editor-in-chief of the AGFI, which is an economic and financial newspaper. So I will have the two hats today. As member of parliament and as journalist, I will not really be a master of ceremony. I will especially be listening to you. So you saw I took a book, and I'll be taking notes and seeing what happened since 30 years, where we up to now, and what must we do for the 30 next years. And I'm really looking forward to listening to you. Thank you very much for being here. And it was my pleasure to welcome the president of IMD, Jean-François Manzoni. Thank you, Fatih. Uh, warm welcome to all of you. Uh, you're coming from many, many countries. Uh, of course, some of you coming from very close by, and we're always happy to see neighbors back on campus and alumni back on campus. But some of you are coming from very far away, and we're grateful that you made the time and that you are uh, going to be with us for the next two days. Uh, as the president of IMD, it is, of course, again, my great pleasure to welcome you. It's also my pleasure to maybe talk about IMD for four or five minutes, not much longer than this, because Arturo then has a number of things he wants to share with you uh, with respect to the conference and also to, with respect to the center. But IMD, in a way, uh, is, 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 IMD is not a Swiss organization. We, the way we describe ourselves is we're an organization with Swiss roots and global reach. Uh, but even though we're not Swiss, we have over the years internalized some Swiss characteristics. Switzerland is a, is a hardworking, modest, and discreet country. They don't go around bragging about the stuff that they've done. They tend to be very discreet, very humble, and just get on with it, trying to improve things one day to the next. And, uh, and, and I guess we have kind of internalized this. So, so we tend not to go out and, and boast very much about what we do, which means that in a number of countries, we're a well-kept secret. Um, we tend to be more of a B2B to C brand. We tend to be better known by corporations and policymakers than we are by consumers and executives. Nevertheless, we've been around for 30 years as IMD, uh, and before that, as the product of the merger of two institutions that were very well known, IMD and IMI. And what's different about us is we were not a business school created by a university. We were a school created from the merger of two institutions that had initially been created for executives by executives. So over time, these two institutions, IMEDE and IMI, became academic institutions and started granting degrees. And of course, as the merger of these institutions, we also have an MBA and an executive MBA degree, and we grant degrees very proudly. 
We also have a very large portfolio of activities that are directed more at executives and at organizations. And again, unlike most business schools, the overwhelming majority of our, of our activity is really non-degree related. So that's what differentiates us. Really a, a business school with a strong connection to practice uh, and a strong desire to, have, to produce real learning, but also to have real impact. We also have a vision that we're proud of, and that vision says challenging what is and inspiring what could be. We develop leaders who transform organizations and contribute to society. Uh, it took us a while to agree on every word. As you know, these, these statements can be quite difficult to, to craft, but we're, we're very happy with what we came up with because the core of it is that we develop leaders we develop leaders that have a point of view on things. They're not just tweaking stuff. They're transforming organizations and contributing to society. And the way we do this is by challenging what is and inspiring what could be. Voilà. So, so that's us in a nutshell. Now, of course, if you're an academic institution and an independent academic institution as we are, of course, you're providing programs and you're welcoming students, but you need to have something to tell these students. And, and that's where research comes in. We're all academics. We come from, we very rarely hire people as they graduate from their PhD studies. So all of us at IMD among the faculty have taught somewhere else and researched somewhere else. And then we've decided to come here and, and we've all agreed to do a special brand of research. We want to do research which is rigorous, because if it's not rigorous, then it's not generalizable and it's not really helpful. But we want to balance this rigor with three other characteristics, with, with relevance, meaning somebody needs to have some usefulness for what we're working on. Insightfulness, meaning there's got to be something which is a little bit provocative, we don't want to just quantify the obvious. Um, and then actionable. We want people to be able to do something about it. The World Competitiveness Center is very much part of this tradition and it is a wonderful illustration of this, this blend of rigor, relevance, insight, and actionability. And, and I'm delighted, uh, again, that we were able to organize this 30th anniversary conference and, of course, Stéphane Garelli, the founder of the center, will speak tomorrow. I'm sure Arturo will tell you all about this. Um, from our point of view, the World Competitiveness Center has a very special place within IMD. A lot of what we do focuses on, on executives and, and on organizations. And some of these organizations are for profit, others are not for profit NGOs, but, but we rarely operate at country or regional level and at policy making level. So the World Competitiveness Center is really a great opportunity for us to be relevant for and to interact with these policy makers and these countries. Um, we have this ranking and other rankings that again Arturo I'm sure will present. Um, we are very proud that this ranking is used by a number of countries in their policy making initiatives. Uh, we are very proud and happy that they also invite us once in a while to help them come up with, with policies that, that will help improve the state of their nation. Uh, when I think of policymakers and of politicians, of course, I I'll always remember this sentence by Jean-Claude Juncker when he was at the European Commission saying, we all know what to do. Uh, the problem is we don't know how to do that and then be re-elected. Um, so, so again, we empathize a lot with the difficulties that policymakers and politicians face in coming up with policies that A, will work, will be effective, and will contribute to develop a more effective, but also a more sustainable and a more fair world, because that at the end of the day is what we're trying to do, uh, and be also accepted and, and re-elected by their, by their constituencies. Voilà. So again, very important anniversary for us, for a very important center within IMD, something which is, which is unique. We have other centers, but they're more uh, closely aligned to executives and organizations. This one is really truly special. 
Of course, the research and the insights come out of it are of great relevance to executives and organizations. But as I said, it's also an opportunity for us to address another constituency. So delighted to be here, delighted that you will be with us for the next two days. And a uh, warm welcome to all of you. I wish you a fantastic conference. And I pass the baton to the current director of the World Competitiveness Center, Professor Arturo Brice. Uh, good afternoon, honorable guests, uh, alumni from IMD and friends of alumni, welcome to this conference. I want to start by thanking Professor Jean-François Mansoni for making this conference possible and also because he's my boss. <laughs> so I need to the always... One. Uh, yes. Voila, of course. <laughs> so I need to start with recognition, but also let me thank you all for, for being here. Our conference is commemorating the 30th anniversary of the World Competitiveness Center that we, or at least someone else, started some time ago in order to analyze, manage, but also you know, uh, assess and measure the competitiveness of countries. And I think that's a very important mission that we have implemented over the last years. I think this work would not have been possible without the help of our loyal partner institutes, which we have listed on the back of the room to make sure that we will recognize the joint work that we have ever done. And many of you are obviously represented here, and we want to, we want to thank you for that. The center's partner institutes are sometimes universities, governmental entities, um, business associations, um, have made us the reference in competitiveness studies in the last 30 years. And despite us being a small team, I think we have been working with an extensive network of partner institutes, which we are very grateful for. We also want to recognize our alumni, and again, many of you are here. We have explicitly invited to this conference those alumni and friends of IMD that has been historically answering and responding to our executive survey, because they have also made possible that our ranking is respected and used as a role model all over the world in the way we assess and measure competitiveness. So thank you very much as well. And finally, I want to thank all of the government representatives that are going to participate in, in this conference. We have carefully designed the program and we have carefully designed the contents so as you, so as you to have an impression at a glimpse at what the best practices are in competitiveness or prosperity. So education, technology, infrastructure. We are going to have 16 countries represented in our discussions. Some of them are poster children of uh, good competitiveness cases, Hong Kong, Switzerland, Singapore. Some countries are newcomers, Colombia. Okay. Still doing fine, struggling, but actually showing us what are the right ways to go in order to achieve prosperity for, for people. Uh, our discussions will hopefully set some light not only on what we have done, but also on the future. And that's what we want this conference to be. I think um, we want to make sure that we help countries ensure prosperity in the 21st century in a world that is confused with the barriers to trade, uh, populism, political fights, uh, and even the challenges of technology. Okay? So our objective in this conference is to actually show countries the way forward, and especially to share practices. Uh, for IMD, this is a unique event as President Mansoni was saying, because we are uh, used to and devoted to private sector as a, as a business school, but we also understand that the national and global environment in which a company operates is a factor to ensure that the, that the, the company succeeds. Um, I always use the same examples. You know, institutional factors make it impossible for IKEA or Google to be present in North Korea. Okay? You may have the best innovators in North Korea. I'm sure that you will not have a digital champion in North Korea. Okay? And this is probably an extreme example. But I, I strongly believe that it will be very unlikely to see corporate triumphs in certain countries. And on the contrary, the reason why we see some countries like the United States or China excelling today in the private sector is primarily because they have very strong public sectors. And I'm not saying very strong governments, 
but very strong public sector. That is public sectors that truly understand what the role of the government should be. A competitiveness summarizes in one word this combination of a regulatory, political, economic and social considerations that we believe that determine the performance of companies. So that's what we will show in this conference, that in the 21st century, governments are more important than ever. Okay? And as Diego Molano, uh, the former minister of technology from Colombia, was telling me earlier, the only way to understand the private sector is to get to know the public sector. And the best way to understand the public sector is to get to know the private sector. That's the bridge that we try to gap at the IMD World Competitiveness Center. Um, IMD, again, pioneered this field. And we have since contributed, since 1989, to the improvement of the conditions in many countries of the world. I want to recognize here the work of Professor Stefan Garelli, who created the center already uh, 30 years ago, and who should receive all the credit for developing the methodology that has made the IMD World Competitiveness Center the true pioneer, but also the leading institution in understanding and analyzing the competitiveness of companies. Uh, you can see here all of our world competitiveness reports, and it is very interesting to go through not only the results. Uh, for example, Japan was the most competitive economy uh, a couple of decades ago, okay? and it has dropped significantly in the last years. But also, to see how our approach has been changing, incorporating more and more, for example, digital and social ingredients into our, into our metrics. Uh, I will use here a metaphor that I have copied from my, from my good friends in Thailand and our partner institute in Thailand, the, the um, Thailand Management Association. Um, I heard this comparison as competitiveness being a cycling race, in which in order to win the race, you need to have a good road you need to have a good bicycle, and you need a good cyclist. Uh, the road is the infrastructure of the country. You need roads, highways, but also the infrastructure is intangible. You need the, you need the education, you need healthcare. Uh, once you have the road, then you need a good bicycle. Uh, the bicycle is the public sector. Okay? The, it's the machine that runs fast. But in order for the public sector to ride fast, you need a good cyclist. And the cyclist needs to be strong enough in order to move the bike. Now, it is very important that the, the bicycle and the cyclist, they fit together. Because if you have a very big cyclist with a very small bike, it doesn't go far. And it's the opposite. If you put a small kid riding a huge bicycle, it will not ride fast either. Okay? So you need to make sure, and we need to make sure that the public and the private sector, they work together so as to have a perfect match between the cyclist and the bicycle. This we will entertain tomorrow when we talk about public-private partnerships. But we believe that this is clearly a key to, to, understanding, to understanding competitiveness. And then to explain why it is so important for, for the private sector. Okay? I also want you to see, finally, uh, from our examples in the conference, that there is no country that does everything well. And in that sense, there is no role model of competitiveness. Okay. We can actually take some examples from different countries, which is what we will try to do. But a very big mistake that some countries make is to try to copy one another. Okay. Something that we have experienced in the last 30 years is that while Hong Kong excels in fighting corruption, Estonia excels in its digital policy, and Switzerland excels in education. But no single country makes everything or does everything perfectly fine. So what we need to learn from each other is these small details that will complement each other. And that's why it's very important to share. That's why I also think that having this conference in which our partner institutes come together is hopefully something that we can do also in the future, okay? because we need to share our practices. OK, that's all on, on my side. I hope that you find our discussions interesting. And I hope that we put together some ideas uh, that make our work easier, that you help us make our work easier by giving, giving good insights. Um, just let me say that today we have in the audience represented 43 nationalities. So one of the objectives of our discussions is that you just don't listen to the panelists and you listen to their stories, but also we listen from you and you tell us what you think of the examples that we are, we are discussing. Okay? 
Thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to a very successful conference. Thanks. Thank you very much, Arturo. I think you can just stay on stage with us okay. as you are moderating the first uh, round table. What, what do you mean, no country does everything well? <laughs> are you sure? I'm okay, getting cut so, so it's a landa, so it's yeah. a landa. <laughs> I always get some kind of chauvinistic at some point as a Swiss MP. But I just want to add to what Jean-François Manzoni and Arturo were saying. As a Swiss member of parliament, we are also very proud having IMD here in Switzerland. Uh, education, as you said, is rather good in Switzerland. And this is thanks to guys like you, IMD, APFL, polytechnic schools, universities. And we are really struggling to work hard on this. But as I mentioned two or three days ago here, we could invest a bit more in Switzerland. I think so. That was a personal opinion. But whatever. Big program, a lot of work uh, today and tomorrow. As you mentioned, after all, we'll be talking about consensus in a few minutes, education, technology, public-private partnership, and beyond GDP, which will be the last uh, roundtable. I'm really looking forward to this. And we'll start now with our first roundtable, uh, building national consensus, on which we are quite good in Switzerland too, <laughs> by the way. But I'd like to welcome uh, our speakers on stage. Uh, Danis Kravis, former Minister of Economy of Lithuania, most welcome. Abdullah Luta, also with us. You can get out applause. <laughs> Director General of Competitiveness Centre in UAE. And Diego Molano, former Minister of Technology of Colombia. Welcome to you. After all, the floor is yours. And at the end, we'll have Q&A session. Thank, Thank you. you. Let, me, let me first introduce our speakers to you, and then I will briefly introduce the, or, the topics. Uh, first, on my, on my left, we have a, a long-time partner of the IMD World Competitiveness Center, our partner in the United Arab Emirates, and his head, you know, the, His Excellency Abdullah Nasser Luta, who is the Director General of the Federal Competitiveness and Statistics Authority. The UAE set up a special governmental department to deal with competitiveness as an objective of, of policy. Thanks to you. Uh, thank Thanks you. to you. And his, his Excellency, in fact, is also responsible for managing the country's policies with regards to SDG implementation in the United Arab <coughs> Emirates. Um, he has an extensive experience in the private sector as well as in the, in the public sector with different governmental functions and as I said earlier, more recently, working closely, not only with the IMD World Competitiveness Center, but with other international organizations, trying to improve the competitiveness of, of, the, of the United Arab Emirates. Thank you for, Thank you. for being here with Thank us. For the okay. um, um, our second guest is um, Danius Kravis. Danius Kravis is, uh, has been in, in my radar screen personally, as a representative of a country that I will explain in a second, but actually is a very good example of what we are trying to discuss today. Okay. Then you should also uh, come with sec uh, in, um, experience in the private sector and is currently a member of the parliament in Lithuania in the, is the sixth Seimas or the seventh Seimas? The, in the par which edition of the parliament? Is the fifth? I yeah. <laughs> like counting, no? But the, so he's a parliament member of the, of the, of the same, but was also the Minister of the Economy in Lithuania uh, between 2000 and... Uh, uh, eight, nine, eight, eleven, during the crisis. During the crisis, basically. Okay. <laughs> Let's say in that way. And, and I'm, I'm very looking forward to having our discussions. And finally, on the, on the, on the very, very far right of our panel, we have uh, Diego Molano. Uh, Diego is, first of all, extremely kind and flexible to adapt himself to our discussion. He was originally planned to, to speak in the topic of uh, technology and government, and you are actually welcome to do so. But I also ask him to join us today in this panel, because Colombia represents a country where you, know, you have seen this issue of building consensus as a big challenge. Okay. Uh, Diego is currently a digital advisor based in Washington. He's board member in many different companies in the private sector, but was also for a few years Minister of Technology in the Government of Colombia under President Santos. Um, last but not least, Diego is an MBA graduate from IMD for the class of... 2001. 2001. So we're extremely proud of, of, our, of our school. 
because you know as we were discussing earlier, we want to see more MBA graduates working in the private in the public sector. Okay. So thank you very much to the three of you. Let me introduce the, the topic, what, what I want to discuss first. One of the issues that I think is key for the 21st century when it comes to competitiveness is to make sure <coughs> that reforms are implemented. Okay? Now, in many, in many countries, the problem with implementing reforms is not the lack of leaders or the lack of ideas. It's the lack of national consensus. And if you go around the world <coughs> today and then you look at countries like France or Mexico or Argentina, okay, and the failures that you see to implement reforms they're all caused by the lack of national consensus. Meaning that from the public sector, you don't see either an intention or even a strategy to involve <coughs> people in you know, making these reforms successful. You know, President Mansoni is one of our leadership professors as well, has written a lot about change management. And he explains how, how in order to implement change in the private sector, you need, as a leader, to by to, to build a coalition with your team members, you need to communicate, you need to empower people, you need to help people to take the pill. And that's something that may, many governments fail to do. Okay? That's why we want to have this panel at the beginning, is how to build national consensus. Okay? And I want to start with Anius, because um, Lithuania is a very particular case. Just to give you some background, Lithuania was a country that suffered the most from the European crisis in 2008, but was also the country that recovered the fastest. And it was done through a massive, um, harsh policy that took its toll in the population. So I would like to ask you first, what was the, the trick? How did you manage to do it? And how do you assess uh, that process? How painful or successful it was? Uh, thank you for, for the question. I would like to start from the words of uh, John Claude Juncker, that as a politician we usually know what to do, but uh, we don't know how to do and to be reelected. And this is the case why politician is, politicians are afraid to go forward to make reforms. In our case, uh, it, it was opposite. Actually, from one hand, uh, it is a uh, very good thing don't ne uh, never miss good crisis. And the crisis is usually for the country is very good opportunity to go forward. And uh, then the society wants, uh, during the crisis, society wants to listen. And society during the crisis usually are more flexible to accept hard, harsh policy reforms and so on. So, Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to present the, our case a bit uh, uh, and share our view how, how it, uh, all those reforms were done back in 2008-2009. And uh, in 2009, Lithuania was just member of EU just for four years. And uh, Lithuania was at that time with very strong economy, but uh, very clear signs already appeared of overheating, uh, overheating economy. And uh, at that time, really, the ruling coalition neglecting at all those signs, as uh, our budget deficit was more than 4%, for example, very high inflation, double, 9% almost, big current account deficit, double digit credit growth, bubbles in real estate and stock market. Just before election, significantly raised budget expenditures on various social benefits, as maternity leaves, on pensions, on employment uh, payments, and, and so on. And uh, this was a significant error, as I, because as I mentioned already, our uh, deficit, budget deficit was at 4%. And, uh, and I would like to mention that now we are in Eurozone, but at that time, the, our currency lead us was back to Euros, and this was as well blow to our stability of our currency. And, uh, 2008 elections came and we won, we won those elections. We are conservatives, we, we won uh, those elections. And just after elections, uh, Lehman Brothers failed. The perfect storm globally in global markets. And Lithuania was, in, as I mentioned, in bad shape. And we were hit, it, uh, hit uh, immediately. Uh, and just in one year, 
Lithuania's GDP fell 14%. Budget deficit slumped below 9%. And budget incomes contracted 30%. 30. It, it's, uh, we've followed budget incomes almost each day. And we see that what the hell is going. What, that we, and we needed to act. And we needed to act very fast. Uh, and, uh, and we introduced measures which we would like to, uh, to implement uh, and to reaction from, from society and from different groups of society was, was uh, very negative. Very negative. We encountered demonstrations and even the windows of parliament were broken. And, and uh, at that point, uh, we sit down and, and, and just thought what, what to do. And uh, in our discussion appeared that uh, what we need, we need national agreement. The national ag agreements with m most influential groups of, of society, trade unions, business organizations, and, and others. And we started, started to ne negotiate. And uh, we started to negotiate. Uh, uh, negotiations were very tough, very tough because the measures included, for example, tax raises on VAT tax. We raised from 18 to 21 uh, percent. We abolished uh, uh, all, almost all tax exemptions for different groups. You can imagine, of all those different groups, were very dissatisfied with, with, with that. Uh, actually, we cut uh, we cut uh, all social benefits, pensions including, and, and maternity leaves, uh, on everything. So, uh, and uh, fiscal, co fiscal consolidation was, was as well, as I mentioned, harsh, and, and, and almost every payment in different, to different sectors from, from the budget was, was cut. On, a, another hand, on another hand, it was proposed that uh, we are going to allocate somewhere around 5% uh, uh, from our GDP uh, to stimulation of, of the economy. Uh, we used EU funding and as well, as well budgetary instruments. And finally, we agreed with all stakeholders that uh, plan is OK. They signed national agreement, all, almost all trade unions. Uh, all business organizations, even such small uh, organizations as pen pensioners' unions, signed sign the agreement. Uh, with exception, opposition didn't sign the national agreement. And in parliament, tried to block implementation of all reforms. Hearings in parliament were day and, and night because we try to stop uh, in, uh, in, uh, with, with all means. But finally, we succeeded, and, and uh, we, we went through. And uh, for example, if we, talk, uh, if we are talking us about uh, business, uh, about uh, uh, economy stimulation pack, I was Minister of Economy, was responsible for, for, uh, for that field. Uh, we, helped, we helped companies, but particularly SMEs, to access, uh, access to, to liquidity. The taxes to liquidity, uh, it was credits, it was uh, uh, loans guarantees, uh, compensation of interest payments, and, and others. Uh, we initiated major uh, public sector buildings uh, renovation project, which accounted almost 2 3% uh, uh, from, mm. from uh, our GDP. At that time, we elected, we created uh, uh, public agencies as Invest Lithuania, Enterprise Lithuania. You see some guys from Enterprise Lithuania here sitting in, in, in this conference. And the uh, organization was created in, during the crisis to support uh, Lithuanian exporting companies and to foster entrepreneurship uh, during, during the crisis. And, uh, and results, uh, and results uh, 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 very immediately, but uh, uh, by the year 2011, so in two years, after 
major economic low, Lithuania's GDP was growing by 4.5%. Uh, general government balance was zero. Inflation was back on the track, 3.4%. As I mentioned, in 2008, it was 9%. And uh, during the crisis, we supported almost a third of all Lithuanian enterprises. And uh, thanks to agent, thanks to Invest Lithuania, which now is one of the best uh, investors attract, uh, investment attract, uh, attracting uh, agencies in, in Europe, our, our uh, foreign investment investments were growing uh, uh, 35% a year. And we got, in, just in one year after crisis, we got such, such names in Lithuania as a Barclays, Western Union, ABM, and other, other companies. But we were very proactive. <coughs> So, back to Mr. Juncker's words that uh, politically, yes, we were punished. <coughs> yes, we lost next elections just after four years, but uh, with very, very narrow margin. And having in mind that, that we implemented such a huge scope of, of reforms, we considered that the election's results were really good. During, during the crisis, we learned lessons as well. First, as our then Prime Minister, Mr. Kubilius, used to say, we understood that the deficit of political will is more dangerous than fiscal deficit. Second, that national agreement gave us mandate to implement heavy reforms and harsh Fiscal, fiscal consolidation measures. Without national agreement, we cannot do that. And finally, internal devaluation really worked in the Baltic states. And our example later was, was as a roadmap for Greece and Spain in, in, during their difficult times. So finally, now in 10 years after the crisis, since 2010, Lithuania's economy is, uh, is the second fastest, has second fastest growth in, in, in EU. So that is our story. Mm -hmm. So which advice would you give President Macron, Macron in France? <laughs> <coughs> oh, uh, actually, as, as I mentioned, we, in the beginning, <coughs> we had the same problem. First of all, I think as a president and our prime minister, you should be humble. And you should, first of all, ask, to ask, ask advice of your people. I mean, you need to sit around one table and discuss issues. Because if you do not have agreement, particularly on, on very difficult reforms, you usually will get your parliament windows broken. So you should Thank sit you. down and, 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 and go for, for agreement. We'll hopefully continue this discussion in a, in a second. Let me move on to Abdullah sure. and, and the case of the UAE. You, know, you come from a country that, uh, that has been extremely successful, but also where could, there could be a temptation by the leaders to overlook people's needs. And in contrast, the objective of the government has always been to put people first. Yeah. And I know that there is a new economic strategy coming forward. How do you, so what is the differentiator in the UAE, or how do you think that you put people's needs, and how do you bring you know, the population's needs and the voice to making decisions in order to make sure that there is a partnership between, between individuals and, and the government? Sure. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I definitely don't want to answer anything about uh, French uh, pol politics later on. Uh, many people don't know me as Abdullah Luta back home, but they call me Abdullah Competitiveness. This is good and bad at the same time, because when you say it. competitiveness, this means that some work needs to be done by some uh, entities. So I'm, I'm disliked by some uh, government officials, maybe. Uh, I think what, what happened in the UAE is phenomenal. And um, we learned it the very hard way. We went up and down in competitiveness reports. And I'm, I'm thinking, you know, being doing competitiveness for 30 years, this is an amazing story by itself. 
When we started looking at competitiveness at that time, I was working for Microsoft. So half of my career, I've been working for 24 years. Half of it was private sector, mostly with Microsoft, in different parts of the world and in the banking sector. So I was more into making money for the banking sector as well as for the banks back in Redmond, Washington, USA. Uh, and then I, I got a meeting with um, the Minister of Cabinet Affairs in the Prime Minister's office in late 2008. And you think about 2008 was a crisis. Really bad time to recruit anyone or even to think about creating something totally new. I go into this meeting in August with the Minister of Cabinet Affairs, His Excellency Mohammed Al-Gargawi, who's my boss now. Uh, he said, we would like to launch something called competitiveness, competitiveness unit. When we call a unit in the UAE, we mean one person, but we <laughs> give it a title, so it's a unit. <laughs> so I said, sure, and he said, what do you know about competitiveness? I, have, I said, I know nothing about competitiveness, what you're talking about, but I'm a good learner and I can, unfortunately I did not get my education in IMD, I'm sorry about that. I got my education in the UK. So um, I said, I, I'm gonna work hard and I'm gonna learn. And he said, listen, I like this answer. We also don't know competitiveness. And I want you to work with global organizations that have been in the competitiveness business for some time so that you learn the ABC competitiveness and you take this country and build uh, the brand in it. And you're gonna fail sometimes, and you're gonna succeed at times. We will celebrate the good moments, but you will also get punished for the bad moments. I said, agreed. It took him six months to actually finalize the contract. Because as he says today, and I have a lady from my team, Sumaya, raise your hand. Whenever he meets with them, he says, I never trusted Abdullah would do it. Now it's been almost 11 years together. Um, we learned it the hard way. This is the beauty of the UAE government. Once they have something, they invest in it. So we started with three people at that time, and today we are 110 staff members. The growth rate in a government office is phenomenal over these years. The who's who started contacting us and the who is who we started to reach out to. Naming one is IMD. Professor Stefan Garelli is a very good friend of the UAE. Participated in so many events and when we reached out to entities, IMD was the first actually. There was the IMD, the World Bank, Ease of Doing Business Report and the World Economic Forum, three of them. And I was sent to all these kind of nice places and I says go and discuss with them how we can build competitiveness indicators. Competitiveness for us was unique because the IMD has a definition, the WEF has a definition, the World Bank has a definition, the OECD has a different definition. We decided to create our own that is suitable for the UAE. Each country is unique and we need to respect that and we need to understand that. So what mobilizes and moves people in Singapore is totally different from what it will move them in the Middle East or what will move them in Latin America. We cannot cut and paste and expect people to react. Therefore, when we decided, we said, what does matter the most for the UAE? The UAE is considered by some, and we hope many of you believe that, we truly believe in that, that it is, it is giving hope for the Middle East region. If you look around us, there is so much fire, there is so much negativity. Many people associate the Middle East with bad things. But the minute you land, in the UAE, in Dubai, or Abu Dhabi, or Fujairah, you see these, or Oman, you go and visit Oman, or other places, you see signs of hope. People are well-educated, whether locals like me or expats. There are so many people from around the world living in the UAE. You see the best universities operating there. We have the Sorbonne, talking about French politics, we have the Sorbonne operating, London Business School, NYU, we hope IMD will open a branch one day in, in uh, Dubai. Uh, you see the best of the banking sector operating as their headquarters in these countries. You have lots of expats flying from different parts of the world. My son goes to an international school and he was talking to a friend of his and he said, where did you go for summer? And my son said, I went to Fiji. And Fiji from Dubai is a very long distance, 27 hours. 
And he said, I'm from Fiji. And he just joined the school. His father is a pilot in Emirates. Now, why would people move to a place so far away, different culture, we wear different things, um, we, we speak a different language, Most, more or less our religions are different, our values are different, our traditions are different, our moments of celebrations are different. But you know what, what makes it special is that we learn to live together in a coexistence, cohesive way, where everyone is respecting one another. This is what created competitiveness in a nutshell. We thought for us to continue being the beacon of hope, we need to ensure that we are on our toes every single day. Just like what uh, uh, the, the, the opening remarks by the president of IMD and Fathi as well spoke about, the Swiss, the mentality is that we want to operate, we want to improve day after day. This is what happens in the UAE. Lots of ministers would go to the prime minister and say, I'm doing the best job in education. I'm doing the best job in health. And he says, I'm not interested in that. Give me a global testimonial, an indicator, a competitiveness ranking that says you are the best in entrepreneurship. You're the best in health. You're the best in economy, and so on. So competitiveness became a KPI for our government officials. Now, this is very dangerous because you're not only creating a KPI system from within, which we have. We have a KPI system of almost 300 indicators spread all over the sectors. In addition to that, on top of it, we added competitiveness rankings as a KPI for ministers. That's why sometimes people know me as Abdullah Competitiveness, because I speak to them and said, what have you done on the World Bank doing business, ease of doing business, where there is a pillar speaks about how easy is it to get electricity. According to the World Bank, and the World Bank is not a survey based, it's a dialogue with construction and mm. architects companies, you know that. Dubai is the number one city in the world when it comes to ease of getting electricity. The number one for two years in a row. Now what happens? Many people, actually, many officials, I spoke to some, and I don't want to name some, in Europe, actually. I said, what do you do about competitiveness? And they said, they, we don't care. And I found it astonishing, because they're performing so well. They're, they're in the top 10, even in the IMD book and the other books. And they say, we don't care about competitiveness. We just do our work, and it gets reflected. For us, it's different, because you cannot compare a country that was well established, you have the laws since maybe mm, 1500 or 1600, you have birth certificates in, in Sweden since God knows because of the church system. If you look at us, we did not have birth certificates for some, even at 1971 or 72, because people did not believe in the use of birth certificates. That's why having a systematic approach to measure your improvement as a country was very vital. We did not drop that. On the contrary, it became an agenda that the prime minister is interested in, the vice president of the UAE. Before the IMD gets launched, I immediately text the minister of cabinet affairs and I say, boss, the IMD report will come out. We improved or we, de we decreased in the rank. And we, we, the reason is ABC. He immediately informs the vice president. For some countries, the vice president will not be interested in such things. And maybe that's right. Maybe they should be doing home security. They should be building schools or whatever. For us, it's very important for the vice president to be aware of what's going on. Are we doing the right thing? And is it reflected? You spoke about the road, the bicycle, and the cyclist. For our leadership, cabinet ministers, they're very much interested in the three elements. They're interested in the road, they're interested in the bicycle, as well as the cyclist. So if you look at Twitter and you write IMD UAE, you will see tweets by the prime minister. This is very rare that a president or a prime minister or even a minister will tweet about the third party. Some people would think he's promoting a third party. Some people would think it's, we should stay neutral. Oh, this could could be corruption, or this could be I don't know what. 
For us, we do, we do promote the IMD, the World Bank, the World Economic Forum, the OECD, whenever they come up with the reports. You created a society that speaks competitiveness now because the leaders, the ministers, the director generals speak about competitiveness. If you speak to anyone in the UAE now, almost, even schools, we go to schools and speak about competitiveness, about sustainable development goals. I have a curriculum and a PowerPoint for kids from six years old to 12 year old. And then from 12 to 18, I speak to them differently. And I speak about competitiveness, statistics, and sustainable development goals. Without such drive, you won't be able to improve what, what reports like the IMD did and the competitiveness center of the IMD did, it created a positive change and it created, as the president of the OECD said, it inspired positive change. We changed the laws based on that. We fixed the data system because of that. We became more aware of the private sector needs because of that. We created a dialogue with the private sector and we show more respect and we action what they ask for because we know that they will judge us. And this is, we're here to serve the nation, the people, and the private sector. For us, competitiveness reports like the IMD gave us guts. It made us brave. Many countries, many officials, many politicians will shy away from discussing a politically sensitive topic. For us, there is nothing called sensitive. If you go to the news today and you write UAE parliament elections, women, one of the very few countries in the world now, the UAE is one of them, and I can assure you there are less than five countries. Now we have a quota of 50% split between men and women. Sweden is 47%. In few months' time, we will be 50%. We will be ahead of any OECD country. We will be maybe third in the world because there are actually two countries where they have reached 63% and some of them 58%. Why did we do that? And I, I'll tell you the story and I'll end up with this. This is when you mobilize a society because everyone is going to election polls now in the UAE as we speak and to embassies around the world, including the embassies here. I spoke to a lady, a very senior lady in the UAE, Sumaya Nasser, and I said, I have a proposal. And I know this was discussed even by the first lady in the UAE, saying the society is 50-50. Why do we have only 20? Many people say 22% is very high for women in parliament. Some countries in OECD do not, did not reach 22. We thought 22 is not reflecting reality. We should be 50-50. I'm a man. I believed in that. I spoke to a lady, senior level, and she said, Abdullah, this is very risky, politically sensitive, and you need to challenge constitution. She did shy away from taking that risk. My team and I believed in it because some reports measure this. There is the United Nations uh, gender balance report, mm -hmm. and there is the World Economic Forum gender gap report. They measure this. I believe in this because this is core business and it's good for the nation. And if Sweden can reach 47, we can reach 50. And if there is a country that has 63%, it's Rwanda, by the way, which is an amazing country. President Kagame is doing a remarkable job. And I hope one day maybe he will become a speaker because I attended some of his speeches. Mm -hmm. uh, President Kagame of Rwanda. Uh, I went to Minister of Cabinet Affairs. I spoke to him on the phone. I said, boss. This is the thing that I'm trying to push. And he said, why? I said, because it reflects society. Women have, should be 50% of par parliament. And he says, can you give me some background? I said, I'll create two slides. Now, this is something many of you are leaders, government officials, CEOs, bosses. They don't have much time. You either spend five minutes in the corridor or while walking from one meeting to another or on the phone or one on WhatsApp. Okay, my boss is WhatsApp phone calls, and if I'm walking from one building to another, I walk with him, which he hates sometimes because I also I always have some action to take. So I did carry this for with me, and I said these are two slides, and I want you to 
look at it. And he looked and he says, what do you want? I said, 50% split. He looked and he said, OK, can you present this next week in cabinet? I'll give you five minutes. Many people would say, no, I need more time. I need to prepare. I need my background information. You're presenting to cabinet. All the ministers, the vice president, the prime minister will be there. I said, yes, I will. I presented it. And boom, it was done, approved, signed by, not by the prime minister, it was signed off by the president of the UAE. Now, this is a real life example where global competitiveness reports, not necessarily IMD, because we're talking about competitiveness in general. Global competitiveness reports, if they're done with genuine interest in making societies and communities better, they serve that purpose. They create a path for the future for generations to come. They create hope. They create aspirations. Today, we have nine lady ministers in cabinet. You think about the Arab world, this is the highest number of lady ministers. The youngest minister in the world was UAE, the Minister of Youth, 22 years old, UAE national, a graduate from NYU and Oxford University. She still wears her hijab. She still wears her abaya. But she speaks five languages. Now, many people think the Arab world, the abaya, the hijab, will prohibit minister from you know, being open. That the very wrong assumptions. I have a minister. She's the Minister of International Cooperation, Her Excellency Rimi Hashmi. Graduate from Tuft University, Harvard University, and guess how many languages she speaks? And she's learning another one now. Mm -hmm. She speaks and writes seven languages, and she's learning the eighth. Mm -hmm. And she's a mother of three children, three boys, and she's mm -hmm. 40 years old. <clears throat> Thank you. If you look at Reem, Reem was an, insp an inspiration for so many ladies. But these are the kind of things that you want to create in societies keep the societies live the way they want to live. Mm -hmm. But they should become open for the future. They should become global societies. We speak about global citizens. But we, now what we need today are global societies. Mm -hmm. That, that you, ga, you guys have a competitiveness at schools is making me the happiest man on earth. We so, do. Thank you. Not a, as a structured curriculum, yeah, but, but one day we will. <laughs> That's one um, of my KPIs. Diego. On to you. So Colombia is a different example. You know, as you know, uh, Sebastian Edwards, an economist from UCLA, National of Chile, has written this book, in which he claims that in Latin America you have this fracasomania or this uh, ability to fail in everything that countries do, <laughs> because one of the reasons, one of the reasons I say, is because you know uh, you have a continuous series of reformist governments, one after the other, in Chile, in Colombia, in Argentina in Mexico that uh, do, not, do not make it happen. So what is your experience in Colombia? What do you think has been done differently? Because Colombia, for example, has jumped six positions in our competitiveness ranking in 2019. How do you, how do you see that, that governments can make the difference in Latin America, and in particular in Colombia? You know, first of all, Arturo, thank you, for, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm, I'm really happy to be back at IMD in my school. It is, it is a pleasure to be here. So please raise your hand. Who's been to Colombia? Not many people. Why? Because it is dangerous. <laughs> you, know? you know, the highest risk of going to Colombia today is wanting to stay. <laughs> you know, Colombia is the size of France, Spain, and Portugal combined. It's a very, very large country with 50 million people. I was in the private sector uh, working here in Europe, and then and President Santos called me and said, do you want to be the Minister of Technology? I said, yes, it was 2010. <clears throat> then at the cabinet, uh, the, the first week, we, we were discussing what to do. In a country that has been under a war for more than 60 years, with more than 300 350,000 people killed in the conflict. Uh, but the, most, the single most important problem of Colombia was poverty. 48% of Colombians were under the poverty line. So 
the first thing was to tackle that issue. So how we do the reforms to solve the single most important which was poverty. So every single minister, every single minister just focus on that. How the health minister increases coverage of health to reduce poverty. How the education minister in increases education coverage to, to, to reduce poverty. How the technology minister expanded technology to reduce poverty. And we were very, very successful. We went from 48% to 25% in just four years. So there was a very clear message. Communication was key to reduce poverty. But then the main bottleneck to increase, OK. OK, thank you so much. Yeah, that's good. So. But the main bottleneck to competitiveness was the war. So <clears throat> President Santon said, we have to get a peace deal here. And then we focus on, on, on getting the peace deal. And the first thing is that we didn't get that national consensus. I mean, who wants peace? Everybody. We thought everybody wants peace. We went to a referendum to approve the deal with the FARC. We lost the referendum. There was no national consensus. So we had to change the agreement with the FARC. And then instead of going to referendum, we, we maneuvered the political waters of the Congress to get it approved. And it is approved. And the main reason of, the, of that jump into <coughs> of competitiveness of Colombia was the peace. A huge transformation. You know, we went from. More than 70 murders per 100 inhabitants in 2002. Last year, we had about 20, which is way better than Brazil that has 30, or Washington, this city, city where I live now, which is 25. So people couldn't go to the you know, rural areas of Colombia now they can do. People can invest. We got investment grade. So the single most important reform was getting peace. And we all align on that, how every single member of the cabinet builds the right things to do it. We couldn't do a lot of big reforms. We couldn't reform justice. Why? Because we didn't have that national consensus. We couldn't uh, build uh, like a good education reform because we didn't have that consensus. Um, and the key element here is communication. We are in a new era of communications. Building that national consensus today in the world is almost impossible in most countries. Why? Because there is a miscommunication big time between government leaders and people. Big time. Government leaders still do not understand how to communicate with the new generations. And the other big barrier we have is the lack of trust in institutions. You know, in, in Latin America, look at what it is happening today. You know, there is no government in Peru. There is uh, a, a movement again uh, going back to the old policies in Argentina. What happens today in Venezuela? What happens today in Mexico? That's, those are, in those countries, policies clearly against competitiveness. Why? Because policy makers and politicians haven't made the link between good competitiveness policies and votes. And this is politicians need votes. But people on the street do not understand that. They don't ask for that. If you see the campaigns for president in Mexico, in Colombia last year, in Costa Rica, uh, uh, in Argentina, n basically they don't promise anything on competitiveness. People don't care about that. Things are changing very, very fast. So we have to create institutions that understand that new world. 
And let me, let me do a, a, an example here. Could you please pull out your cell phones, everybody? Everybody pull out your cell phones. You know? Please unlock them. Unlock them. You, you, the fingerprint or the code or your face, unlock them. OK? Give it to the person next to you. You don't want to do that. Do you? Please raise your hand. Who has a Facebook account? Who has a WhatsApp account? Who has a Google account? Who read the contract when you opened that account? <laughs> Two or three people. I mean, Facebook is a fantastic company. Actually, they, they are my client. So, so. Uh, Google is a fantastic co company. And all, all the big techs are fantastic, fantastic companies. But when you read a contract, you give all your life to them, all the information. Even the calls you make on WhatsApp, they use that information to sell advertising. But you give your life to them. You trust them. You trust the digital world. If you read the WhatsApp contract, the law that it is applicable under that contract is the California law. I was telling Mark Zuckerberg, look, look my and poor people in the Colombian mountains, they don't even know where California is. <laughs> so they don't have the power to file a complaint, you know? Mm -hmm. But we all trust that digital world, and you guys trust more that digital world than the current institutions. If you give the cell phone to your neighbor, that neighbor may be your friend, but that, the, the Swiss law applies. If that person misuses that information, you can sue them in Switzerland. You can send them to jail. But no, you don't trust in the person next to you. You trust this digital world. So what I mean is that we need to change the way those institutions connect with the new world. Mm -hmm. That's key. And unfortunately, Latin America, and I agree with your, with your friend, it is, uh, it is going again <coughs> in, in a wave uh, against good competitiveness policies, moving, moving to the left. Why? Because people do not see the value of those policies because we are not communicating them in the right way. It happened in Colombia. Mm -hmm. It happened in Colombia. Uh, it is happening today to the current government. Good policies, but people don't understand them. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, why? Because policymakers do not understand the new way to make politics. That's, that's, that's the key. So we have to change the way uh, of, of, of building for example, you know, I was discussing this with the President of Colombia a couple of weeks ago. He's trying to do a lot of reforms. Like, but then he proposes solutions for problems that he knows they exist, but people do not know that they exist. So when you try to solve a problem, mm -hmm. a, po a, a political issue, you know that that problem exists, but people do not know. So first, what you do is you position the problem. You really make sure that people understand the problem and understand the possible solutions, and then you propose a solution. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> what we have to do, Arturo, is to create a new kind of uh, era of government leaders <laughs> that understand this new world. Mm -hmm. and so that would be my follow-up question to the, to the three of you then. Uh, if communication is such a big challenge, to what extent technology, for example, but then you also mentioned that earlier, communication being important, but to what extent technology can change the world, ca can change the way how governments involve people and uh, how this consensus is, is built? Yeah, but uh, good, ask, uh, good answer. Uh, communications uh, works now in, uh, in two ways, the two sides of, of the same coin. On, on on the, um, one side, that uh, what we have in Latin, for example, that everything is available now, is broadcasted live. Uh, seatings of parliament, uh, committees, seatings, uh, meetings of government, everything you could get uh, on internet. Everything is explained on, on social media, on, on Facebook, Twitter, and all around. Uh, that means people get lots of information. But the problem is that for the people, it's very difficult to navigate in this forest of information. If, if, amount of information is so huge that uh, usually 
person is lost. Why we called media media? Because we were mediators between decision makers, politicians, and society. Uh, in some way, explain. Now we have direct access, but but people, but for people, it's very difficult to understand. And and uh, what we what we get as uh, uh, usually in, uh, for example, in uh, social media, people uh, uh, people used to live in tribes and in bubbles. We uh, formed on Facebook or Twitter. We have bubbles. In those bubbles. Uh, People govern look at look, uh, uh, like-minded people, and uh, you in the, through through those bubbles are transparent. You can see another guy from other bubble, but you cannot com communicate because he does not listen to your arguments. He has his own from his bubble, mm -hmm. and this is danger as well. But how to go through those bubbles? How to reach people? How? How to transmit your arguments mm -hmm. horizontally, and uh, I think that uh, we, those tribes and bubbles on 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 uh, social media, particularly affects the, the political field and and as well the radicalization of political field, mm -hmm. and uh, and solution. Solution uh, is not is not ready yet, and uh, and as I mentioned in in in, uh, in the beginning, that this is two sides. As a politician, I'm very glad that I can communicate via Facebook with my constituencies. Yeah? I can just uh, geographically take take the, the region and 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 send Facebook message to them. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's okay, but as well as I mentioned that uh, we are influenced by the tribes, and, and sometimes we don't want to listen to what I say to them. Mm -hmm. So that's two, two sides of the coin. And, and I would just also to you, so because you mentioned earlier how you communicate to the to the nation, but you were also saying that you have the the competitiveness unit of being one single person within the government at the beginning. Oh, how do you also communicate within other governmental entities? Okay. How do you make sure that you have the alignment? Because it's very typical for governments to operate as silos. Yeah. So, I, I think what we did successfully in the U.S. <laughs> is that to make sure that in order for the nation to operate, we need to cooperate so well. Uh, keeping in mind that the United Arab Emirates is maybe, I'm not, uh, you know, afraid of saying that, but the only successful federation in the Middle East. It's made of seven emirates or seven states working together. There, there are few uh, federated systems in, in the Arab world, but there are certain issues between the provinces or the states there. With the UAE, it's different. Since the establishment and under the, 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 the godfather of the United Arab Emirates, the founder of the UAE, Sheikh Zayed, God bless his soul, he created that ambition that this country is going to be the best. The best not by building the best, you know, the, the tallest or the best airport. To, these are material stuff, but he always says this, and this is documented on his black and white TV. He says, I want my people to be the happiest and to live a prosperous life, not for them, but for the future generations to come. This actually summarizes what sustainability is about. Prosperity, sustainability, and quality of life for the future generation. What does quality of life meant for him? At that time, it was black and white TV, and it was an interview. This today is going to be different because it's going to be Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and so on. Um, he said it in humble words, um, in his own words, his, his own language, and he summarized it. The way communication happened is that there is an executive leader that the nation look up to. In Singapore, there is Lee Kuan Yew. We, we in the UAE respect Lee Kuan Yew. Although we're not Singaporean, but we look up to Lee Kuan Yew. When the country decided to invest in the UAE nationals, the people who are 70 years old today, they got their education in Baghdad University, Beirut, American University of Beirut, or AUC, American University in Cairo. Anyone from Egypt, Lebanon, or Iraq? So these are the countries where people got their education. Then there was a second group of people that went to the US 
and the United Kingdom. I was one of those people. And Singapore, this is what happened with Lee Kuan Yew. The government in 1990, they saw Lee Kuan Yew, and we saw this on TV. We saw it in magazines and newspaper. There was no social communication. That Singapore has no oil, no gas, nothing. And it became the, the trade hub and the, the business hub. Hong Kong was also there. The country decided to send staff from the UAE to work in, in Singapore to understand how they operate, to try and learn, to get that aspiration. Each and every single person who spent four years, it was a term of four years, just like ambassadors. Who, which other countries would actually open offices to understand how another country operate? We did that. Each one of them is running a huge organization or a ministry back in the UAE today because we were inspired by these nations. Imagine what inspires people today. With all the communication, is it the YouTubers? Is it those people who we can watch every single moment of their lives, whether they're shopping, whether they're, I'm sorry to say that, they, the, the least thing we can actually get to is actually when they go to the toilet. This is when mm -hmm. they stop filming themselves. <laughs> this is very bad where lots of the younger generation are taking such models as the aspirational models. We're losing quality people in the spam of communication that is taking place. You look at this crowd. How many followers we all will have collectively will be not even 1% of one of the YouTubers that is maybe 6 years old or 10 years old today. Mm -hmm. Exposing their lives, yeah. jumping uh, up and down and living everything, um, uh, homeschooled and so on and so forth. And their parents are making so much money out of that. Mm -hmm. Communication is becoming, technology is not bad. We are the bad ones when we use it badly. Technology is a good thing. ICT is a good thing. Innovation is a good thing, especially mm -hmm. with, with Professor yeah. Bruno here. He believes in innov innovation is a great thing. R&D is a great thing. Who misuses these things? It's us. When we operate in a negative mindset, when we have this evil part of us, trying, you know, the greed part of us is, is yes. dominating. Yes instead of uh, supporting each other, helping the community, and so on, this is when it becomes devastating. Mm -hmm. I think what we try to do in the UN, we're part of the global society. I mean, I have children. I have four children. The youngest one, six years old, I tried to control her so much not to follow. But guess what? Sometimes I get entertained by seeing mm -hmm. those crazy people yeah. doing things. And I say, how could they actually capture my attention by doing silly stuff? Yeah, yeah. They're marketing, money-making machine. Mm -hmm. This is where it's a struggle between the generation gap, between the government. The government in the past, before you do something, you go to a PR, a PR agency, a public relations agency, agency, to draft your press release, or mm -hmm. to, draft your tweet, um, to draft your messages, or to draft your speech. Now mm -hmm. you can't. Everything is captured. You're watched yeah. every you know, 24 hours by seven, you walk around the street, you do something, they capture you, and you, they can translate it into a, a negative story. So this is the risk of being watched every, every single moment while you walk, while you drive. Um, we have presidents, prime ministers, ministers, they can't stop themselves from communicating mm -hmm. immediately. Now, this is good and bad. Do we need to give some, some time to think, to consult, to operate, to address the nation? Or do we actually jump? We, and we'll talk about technology space. tomorrow. OK, in looking detail. forward. And we need, to, we need to have. This is a very diplomatic say We need to have, this, because I want to open up the <laughs> Q&A just with a very, very short question for, for Diego. Hypothesis, just I want to challenge you. Maybe this is a problem of leaders as well. You know, maybe the reason why certain countries fail is because they don't have the right leaders. Uh, and, and that's why they fail maybe to engage the nation. What would you say to that? Yeah, definitely, <coughs> definitely there is a, a, a leadership uh, issue here. Uh, but I, I, I hope that, that 
there is a new generation, and that's happening in, in many cities. And I think this is not about building national consensus. This is about creating the ecosystems. And you see today many cities excelling in terms of competitiveness. And in, you know, in the case of Colombia, Medellin, well known as the capital of narco traffic, the capital of crime in the world, with Pablo Escobar in the 70s and 80s. Today, it is one of the most innovative cities. The Wall Street Journal named the city as the most innovative city in the world. So, and that was a local ecosystem changing mm -hmm. with the right leaders. And that leaders, those leaders are a combination of the public sector and the private sector, and that's key how you build together that strong relationship and, and, and to, to, to build things uh, together. So this is not about building a national consensus, but about building a strong relationships between the public and the private sector. Thank you. Sorry, Fati. Thank you very yeah. much, gentlemen. I propose that just before the coffee break, we take a couple of minutes, or maybe five, 10 minutes for Q and A's, and we can start straight away here in front. The micros are, mics are, and may you just introduce yourself before asking the question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. My name is Christian Genella. I'm the economic counsel of the French Embassy in Bern. Oops. So I think <laughs> there have been a lot of comments about the French politics and economic situation, so I have to answer some questions. Um, because I think there is an update to be made about uh, reform that has been made for over, over the past two years. Maybe it didn't reach out to, to Lausanne, but uh, <laughs> uh, the OECD report is making uh, clear praise of all what has been done uh, over the past two years. Tax reforms, reduction of corporate taxes, regulation of labor taxes, wealth taxes, um, labor market reforms, simplification of hiring and firing, apprenticeship reform. Uh, now, uh, employment benefits reform has been put in place. We are discussing about the pension reform, even if France is one of the better off countries in terms of sustainability of pensions, according to OECD forecast to 2060. Um, financing of venture capital, we are number one in Europe, ahead of UK now. So I think this is good news. So um, I'm very comfortable to hear criticism about the French economy, should it be based on facts and not on easy bashing, because we are suffering a lot in France about this bashing, which is create wrong uh, perception of what is really the French economy. And when 150 French companies were invited earlier this year by President Macron, uh, they didn't ask about the yellow jackets, which is an issue, but the only question was, would the reforms uh, spray continue? And the answer was yes. Okay, that was just my, my statement. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Maybe could, can I ask you a question, if you, you didn't have a question, if I understood no. it correctly. No. Uh, <laughs> There's no France bashing here, I can assure you. But do, do you have the feeling there is a national consensus today in France? We do, this is not the feeling we have. Uh, although the results are there, you're right. There, there are results. But where, how far are we from a national consensus today in France? And what must you do now to build it? Well, I will come back do to you it. need it, by the way? No, every country needs a consensus to, 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 to proceed with reforms. All these reforms were possible in two years without any protest. And the Yellow Jacket movements there were a few was protests. nothing. No, but the Yellow Jacket movements had nothing to do against these reforms. Mm -hmm. Maybe just the wealth tax, that was an issue. But corporate tax reduction, labor, labor market reforms, there was no protest, uh, protest against this. OK, now we have seen protest movements, but it is a different form in France. I think we have seen in different countries in Europe issue about globalization, fear about globalization, and you, I think we should look at the biggest picture here. And it's, okay. it's, it's a different way of expressing some fears about globalization maybe, and we try to address this, and all countries in Europe and in the world try to address this. But uh, I think we should not mix up things about what is national consensus and what is the reform uh, program in France today. Thank you for the testimony. There was another question upstairs, another, another one in front. We'll get to you later on. Good. Just wait for the mic, it's coming. Uh, unless someone wanted to react to the French testimony, you know. Um, good France. afternoon. I'm a former uh, student of uh, Arthur Aubry's, mm -hmm. uh, who I particularly appreciated at the time because he said he was partly uh, guilty of the crisis in 2008 by not realizing what was going on. 
Uh, I've been, I'm of French origin and I became Swiss. I've been living in Switzerland for 25 years. And I find it a bit uh, extreme to say that there were no protests and definitely there is a lack of, uh, of national consensus, which is something very difficult to achieve. Even at the private level, I'm working a lot with uh, um, companies based in uh, Western Africa in particular. And to be able to uh, apply some strategic management or some buying when the, um, when the global surrounding is different, when the governance is different, when the, the, the private sector needs to adapt <coughs> to what it is in infrastructure and public sector is very difficult. So the, the national consensus not only is, is important because you cannot have a buying for a change in a, in a private sector if you don't understand in which surrounding you are, uh, you're supposed to develop your, your business. So thank you for your comments. That was not a question either, sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank question. you. Maybe Arthur, you want to react to someone else? No? So we'll have another question, yes, here in front, or <coughs> one first behind and maybe a mic here in front for another question, please. Yes, sir. Yes, hello. Um, my name is Mohammed al -Zakaf. I'm from Kuwait. Uh, in general, the, uh, my, I do have a question, by the way. Oh, great. <laughs> so uh, my question in particular to um, Mr. Abdullah, uh, to what significance does he believe that the fact uh, that uh, UAE being an autocracy has been a key success factor to their basically uh, being the best, because I do agree with him, one of the best examples of uh, the Middle Eastern countries in the world. Uh, and the reason I'm asking, so that you don't think this is a loaded question, Abdullah, is because uh, in Kuwait, there is a consensus that our democracy has been a real, you know, stick in the wheel, if you will, of any progress. So building national consensus, which is the topic of this round table, usually the parliament, or a democracy is a real apparatus of it. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, do you feel that in some countries, and maybe some more than others, national consensus through true democracies and parliaments are really the ones that are not allowing progress to happen in, the, in that country? So, Abdullah, you can sure. start with that. Thank, Thank you. you, sir, for the question. Thank you very much for the question. Um, I think you need to understand the psychology, although you do because you come from the Gulf region. You need to understand the psychology of each society to understand what moves that society, what mobilizes that society. In the UAE in particular, and this could be applied in different meanings, in different ways in other countries. For example, when I spoke about Lee Kuan Yew and Singapore, those people have a special, maybe spiritual connection with that particular leader that I wouldn't understand, neither a Frenchman, nor an English person, nor an American uh, lady. There is something embedded in the DNA of the society that means something to those people. Yes, we don't have parties, but we have a community where the parties are not needed as we are aware. I can walk in into the president's house. There is a system in place where I can go, give my Emirates ID card, put it in the system, and I can go when the palace is open for visitors. And I can have a conversation with the president for five minutes if I, I want to discuss something. When you walk to a supermarket and you meet your vice president shopping by himself, and you can actually stop and talk, this is something that you might not find in other places. You might find it in some where the, the minister would be a cyclist or something. So if you want to express what we believe that, we want to express things, we speak directly to that decision makers. Our ministers, they don't walk around with entourage. They don't walk around with security. They're reachable by phone. They have to answer calls. Some of them, they don't have walls. They, ha they operate in an office, open space where everyone can walk in. I don't have an open space. I don't have a closed space. I have an open one where Sumaya knows 
Everyone can see me, they can see what I'm doing. If I'm free, they come and talk. This is where the society creates its own system that is suitable for it. Mm. If we are successful in what we do, or for some maybe we're, we're not that successful, but for ourselves, in a span of 48 years, 49 years, what we've achieved so far, for us is phenomenal. We are at a place where so many people did not even reach, even some of the advanced countries. Today, at this very moment, maybe yes or no, the first Arab national who went to space station, not went to space, he's the third person to go to space, but to reach that station, to operate there for six days, is a UA national. He's landing now, at this very, very moment. This is what our prime minister promised the nation three years ago. He said we will be the first Arab nation to send a person to space to the, to the station. Many people doubted that promise. This is why trust in government is something some people doubt it. The first country in the world in trust in government is China. Many people look at China and they have so many negative stories. Being an Arab, honestly, I don't look at China in an, any negative way. I look at it as a huge country with so much richness in history that was thousands and thousands of years. You cannot judge a country, a civilization, that is so deeply rooted, mm -hmm. and you say, I disagree with how they operate. They are number one, according to the Edelman Report in Trusting Government, China is number one. For the people of China, they trust their Chinese leader. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for the, so thanks, you. thanks for the answer. We'll have one last question before the coffee break, yes sir. So continuing in the same vein, I have a question for the two gentlemen who did well for their countries and then lost the elections. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Which is logical. My, na my name is Ian Stewart. I'm a media guy, and a long, long time ago, I was one of the three founders of Wired magazine. Um, I like the comparison made earlier about um, trust in government versus trust in WhatsApp. So I'm one of the people who did read, I always read these legal documents, and even though I sell, saw that they owned everything, I accepted to sign up because of two things. One, um, the utility I received from WhatsApp I thought was enough. But it was enough also to counter the risk of abuse of power that I thought on the other side. So those two things I think are critical for trust. Utility, accepted utility, enough utility from the person giving the power, and then um, the likelihood of abuse of power. What do the two of you think you need to do in your governments and your countries to create that level of trust where the exchange of uh, support is, um, is going to come from your population? Thanks for the question. Maybe sh short answers if it's possible. <clears throat> Basically, um, involving people in the whole process, you know, making sure that people understand in their language, people in, in a way that really uh, it, it is easy to to understand what you want to do. So you have to really create using, using technology a connection with people so that people understand exactly what you want to do and engage people from the beginning. In, in, in the process, as I, as I said, you know, you first start positioning the problems you want to solve. So people understand that they have problems and people <coughs> see the alternatives they have to solve those problems. So I, I, I think you have to really engage people from the beginning. On your side. Just a year ago in Lithuania, a well-known people organized event in which uh, all the nation uh, had to pick up uh, idea for Lithuania. And uh, the idea uh, that the teacher is uh, the most honorable profession in Lithuania won. That means all the nation now is thinking how to reform, how to make our education better. Uh, and uh, we, as a politician, we, we, we will follow. And next year, we are going for elections. And education reform is our biggest priority. We are, we are trying to listen to society. Actually, we need to look at the needs as well, not, not uh, 
everything is seen by society as such. But, but uh, anyway, you somehow you should, should adjust the wish and will of society as well for reforms which are not seen uh, of society, of society, and to to go in the package and to sell uh, and to sell them uh, them back. Mm. It is only one way because if everybody disagrees with what uh, you are doing, that means uh, uh, implementation already on societal level will, 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 will stop all those reforms. So, Thank you very much for the answers, and I think we can uh, thank and applause the panelists. Thank you very much. I understand we all need the building national consensus, but there is a long way to go to get there still now. Thank you very much. And we, we're precisely going to talk about education in the next panel. But now, straight away, I invite you to go to the coffee break, and we'll be back at 4 sharp, please. Thank you very much. See you later. Mm -hmm.